Climate psychology would tell us it's really not that people don't care. People care a lot. We want a healthy world. We want a sustainable, lively future in which we can flourish and thrive and that the next generations can. We want available water and food and not to have these you know, potentials for conflict on top. Um, but we don't engage with that at that level because we're anxious and we're fearful. The library was my space and there was just so much. To the Harbor Grace excursion with the boys to have a time. Wonderful to have you home. It's a total pleasure to be here. Thank you. And to be with you, Nala. <laughs> How often have you been home to Toronto recently? Well, I did come home to have a baby eight months ago and do maternity leave here, and that was a real special time. So left last December. So it's a little bit less hectic this time. It is, definitely. <laughs> You've seen the weather. It's a beautiful time. It's springtime in Toronto, and people are enjoying being out for the first time in a couple of years mm -hmm. in this kind of environment. I'm curious what complicated thoughts um, that a climate crisis researcher might have when she looks around at a spring that, for all intents and purposes, at least appears to be like a, every other spring. Well, the uncanny feeling of seeing warm seasons arrive earlier and earlier certainly makes me think of communities that are keenly aware of how their own Lands are changing, whether it's Inuit and Labrador who are dealing with the sea ice loss week upon week every year, becoming thinner, um, amounting into months into which they can't carry out traditional roles, hunting, fishing, traipsing along the ice where ancestors have for thousands of years, creating this profound sense of ecological grief and what's called solastalgia, a sense of homesickness when you're still at home because the environment has changed so much that it's no longer recognizable. And we all have our own relationships to environmental change and new phenomena of uh, whether it's warming temperatures or eroding coastlines or, um, yeah, perhaps skiing changing as a result of the snowpacks. So, yeah, it brings about those kinds of thoughts. thoughts. A lot of us have thoughts about climate change and are concerned about it and worried about it and consume news about it. But you talk about something called eco-anxiety. How is that different than the average worry about the environment and what's going on with climate change? Eco-anxiety is defined by the American Psychological Association as the chronic fear of environmental doom. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty intense. <laughs> And it does aptly describe the feeling that many people are walking around with. It's not just anxiety. It co-occurs with feelings of sadness, grief, fear, terror sometimes, rage and anger at the injustice of the climate crisis. And also, importantly, this feeling of powerlessness that so many people express and helplessness to be able to do anything about this impending threat. Of course, we know it's already here, but that it's going to get a lot worse because of the costs of historical inaction. And so it can be really constructive and adaptive when it gets someone to take notice and use that discomfort towards collective change, things that can really address the threat that is stressing them when it comes to environmental disruption. But it can become overwhelming and debilitating and have a really negative mental health impact on them if it starts to impair their functioning, which we know it is for many as well. You also often say, and you say in your book, that it is also, a, uh, eco-anxiety eco is a rational fear. Can you explain why you say that? It is healthy and normal and reasonable to be distressed by what is happening. When we confront the meaning of scientific evidence and square that with mass inaction in terms of the scale that's required to really address the crisis in ways that will ensure that we won't cross certain ecological overshoot tipping points, um, we are not meeting our Paris Agreement goals, and so on and so forth. It's a sign that you care, 
that you are awake to this crisis and that you are in touch with the parts of you that take responsibility in life, that want to see humanity's future protected, that want to see vulnerable communities right now bearing the brunt of climate disaster better protected, more resiliently resourced. So it's not a pathology, it's not a disorder, and it's certainly not something that a psychiatrist can give you a diagnosis for, and many mental health professionals argue that it ought to stay that way in order to not pathologize this moral emotion that we can learn to harness for constructive outcomes. Mm -hmm. I do like the way you describe it as, you know, a, as evidence, a sign that you are connected to the world, that you're not forgetting what is happening around you. So in some ways it's a, it's a positive indication. It's a mark of compassion, yeah. yeah. So. You say that it's unavoidable to have this in what you describe as a sick society. And of course, we all have different definitions of what we would call a sick society. But can we talk about that for a bit? Like, what, what do you mean when you say that we live in a sick society? Well, there I'm referring to ideas of maladjustment and activists who have called out throughout history that a society that embraces militarism and war and systemic racism and police brutality and these sorts of things um, if you are not well in that society, if you are feeling maladjusted to those infringements upon social justice, then it is not you who is sick. It is a healthy maladjustment to a society that itself is sick. And I'm connecting the climate crisis to that trend because of the double injustice that's already very well and alive within it. Those who have the least to do with living high carbon intensive lifestyles, um, predominantly poor people of color around the world, but also here at home, um, are, of course, not expending these climate emissions uh, through carbon expenditure, but they are seeing the harm first and foremost, which then adds on to the social justice cause. Um, and furthermore, we are not seeing our institutions step into the roles that are available to them to stop this from getting worse. And we've been dealing with that trend for more than 40 years as we've been attempting to take this seriously in the political arena. We understand extremely well from science historians such as Naomi Oreskes, investigative journalists such as Amy Westervelt and many others that there is corporate malfeasance um, from the fossil fuel industry that has been protecting profits and doing what it can to lobby, of course, the continuance of this, this dependence despite other alternatives to start shifting towards um, and that there were, you know, internal modeling groups, climate modeling groups in the 70s and 80s at, at various companies, at fossil fuel companies that confirmed that this would indeed become catastrophic in the future, around now, um, for a significant proportion of humanity if nothing was done to change course from the corporate planning scenario. Uh, but of course, that the changes weren't made. And so here we are now at this really grief-stricken time of just knowing that we're going to have to incur these costs because of that lack of action taken. But we need to step into the role of empowerment now to transform what we can and protect that which still can be saved because there's a lot there. Um, what I'm worried about is these turbulent emotions that are arising. We can talk about who they affect and, and how we know that these are truly legitimate. Sure. Um, leading to a sense of doom for many people, a feeling that it's too late, that it's futile, um, that we can't do much to, to save ourselves, and therefore it's most authentic to believe that we ought to just like enjoy ourselves while we can and um, say sorry about the rest. How specifically does that manifest itself uh, in the lives of young people who are the inheritors of, of, of society? Right, so my colleagues and I surveyed 10,000 young people between the ages of 16 and 25 in 10 countries around the world. We looked at India, Nigeria, Philippines, but also countries like UK, US, France, some others. And we wanted to understand the scope and burden of eco-anxiety in their lives. And even for those of us who are mired in this because we research climate and mental health, we were alarmed by what we found. 45% of these 10,000 young people said that their feelings about the climate crisis negatively impact their daily functioning. So it's disrupting their ability to eat, sleep, work, concentrate, go to school, play, have fun, be in relationship, basically be an easeful young person. 75% endorsed the statement that the future is frightening. 56% said that they feel humanity is doomed. 
And importantly, it wasn't just that these young people were marking their distress and its impairment in their life because the environment isn't doing well, but we found that these feelings and thoughts were significantly correlated with the sense of being betrayed by governments and lied to by leaders, which introduces us to a very important concept of institutional betrayal and the psychological injury that occurs when those who are dependent upon powerful agents in their lives to protect them but are being belittled, dismissed, and betrayed, they m suffer moral injury from that, and it can make the distress much harder to cope with. It also presents a fantastic opportunity for institutions to step into moral courage, institutional courage, and start to do some of that repair work that we know would help pe young people get by and not necessarily feel in their hearts that, for example, humanity is doomed. I imagine that surveys like that don't happen very often over time, and when they do, they're probably not as sophisticated as the one that you just did. But I'm curious if there's anything in our history that comes anywhere near creating that kind of reaction among young people. You mentioned in the book the, the fear of nuclear war. Absolutely. Is it, is it similar then? There are some really important similarities and differences about other moments of heightened fear of existential threat that would be truly cataclysmic in that totalizing way. Of course, we know that many communities bear the brunt of existential threat here and now and have historically, whether we're talking about the legacies of colonization, slavery, systemic racism, living under an authoritarian regime, under the threat of sexual violence. I mean, we can compare the fear that comes with the climate crisis to, to these kinds of struggles, but then with nuclear, also, um, many people, many Gen Xers, you know, had to do drills sitting under their, yes, <laughs> desks at school getting ready for the apocalypse. Um, my father, who's here, threw an end of the world party for himself around the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, believing that complete obliteration was nigh and that they were totally exposed and there was no recourse of saving themselves. And so psychic numbing takes over in those situations. It's like, well, the injustice is just so palpable, I literally cannot say anything at all. It is truly horrific. And the psychological response, response it's much like when animals play dead in the face of a threat, you can't do anything. And so this immobilizing paralysis takes over, which is how some commentators like to say that humanity as a whole is responding to the climate crisis, because we have these opportunities to intervene and make change. We've been aware of that historically, and yet, we're not acting in the ways that we know that we have to. Is that some kind of psychic numbing on behalf of all of us as a whole? I mean, we can criticize that, but th these are some of the ways in which, um, yes, of course, we can glean information from what has happened before, but we also know that kind of threat, detonate or don't, if a foreign leader just suddenly drops a bomb on you, there's really nothing you can do. However, the helplessness we feel in the climate crisis is a sham because it is the fabric of our world that we are talking about. Every single decision is part of how bad it's going to get and how transformative it can become, which is very different from the powerlessness, of course, of being subject to such an annihilation. I want to take a moment and talk about the word trauma. And it's a word that's used quite often these days. And some would say possibly too widely used. But you don't mm -hmm. hesitate to use it in this context. Can you yeah. explain why? Trauma being understood as something that overwhelms the body's capacity to function, uh, the nervous system and the ability to be in alignment with our finest cognitive capacities and um, basically that kind of system breakdown from overwhelm is relevant in the climate crisis. We're talking about acute trauma, of course, we know from disasters, right? If your house gets burnt down in a wildfire, if you lose property and people that you love, if your, your precious family or um, belongings wash away in a hurricane, all these things from the psychiatric epidemiology we see time and time again can spike post-traumatic stress disorder, clinical depression, anxiety, substance abuse, um, domestic violence, when people are then in a makeshift kind of way trying to recover and perhaps living in new circumstances or being forced to migrate. Um, of course, the migration crisis of the climate, which we are being told to expect, you know, upwards of 150 million climate migrants on the move by 2050. Some estimates say that that's over 1 billion. What that means for 
conflict over dwindling resources, um, you know, that's really deep trauma, let alone like women needing to migrate under the threat of sexual violence and what that does for depression and suicidality. Um, all of this is, is very plain to see in the data. But increasingly, we also understand that simply the awareness of what the predicament entails can be traumatic as well on an emotional level. It's not just that those sitting on the sidelines or doom scrolling about what's happening are in some complete clean category all their own away from that kind of trauma from disasters because it does enter their body. It does somatically disrupt. It can cause panic attacks. We see that it can disturb people's sleep, ability to eat, ability to function. We also, very sadly, have cases of suicide attempts over climate anxiety. And I'm very worried about that being a trend in young people that will uptick. So what we are dealing with is the collective trauma. Often the response to trauma is, is fight or flight. Uh, yeah. and, and I'm curious if, you know, ha have you seen people avoid flight, you know, the withdrawal or shutdown, as you say, when they, when they face a crisis as big as, you know, this planet being in trouble? Have I seen have them you, choose yeah. flight as a defense mechanism? No, have you seen people avoid flight? Like oh. How, how have you seen people Yes, avoid it? well, it's incredible how difficult it is for us to keep all of our senses open to unbearable truths. We've always needed to lie to ourselves a little bit to get by when reality is tough to bear, and it's hugely evolutionarily adaptive for us to do that, and we have these amazing psychological defenses that help us stick our head in the sand or turn away when it's too painful and and pretend ourselves away from reality, honestly. Um, in the climate crisis, many of us have unwittingly been doing this, whether we're often not conscious of it. Of course, there's the outright denial, but then there's this disavowal, this soft denial that many of us understand well if you consider that you care about this crisis. We want political action. We're urging people to find the will. Um, we need the innovators, we need the technologies, we need the policies. Um, and then simultaneously, we turn ourselves away from that truth. We don't talk about it when it's difficult to. We don't push our political leaders on it. We don't necessarily vote for it. We hop on the next plane, we go about our business, we work polluting jobs. And many of us are complicit, and that makes us uncomfortable, just recognizing that complicity. Um, it's a difficult ambivalence that this provokes which also comes with anxiety, and so it's much easier to tamper things down. You know, I, there are many climate activists who will say that it feels like they are walking around in a sea of apathetic humans, as though people just don't care about the climate crisis around them. And climate psychology would tell us it's really not that people don't care. People care a lot. We want a healthy world. We want a sustainable, lively future in which we can flourish and thrive and that the next generations can. We want available water and food and not to have these, you know, potentials for conflict on top. Um, but we don't engage with that at that level because we're anxious and we're fearful and it provokes this cognitive dissonance, which is very uncomfortable of holding two opposing thoughts in the mind at the same time, which is recognizing one's complicity, perhaps lifestyles, behaviors, livelihoods that are contributing to the problem and then simultaneously hold those environmental values. And so instead we split that off and we, we separate from the kind of caring parts of ourselves um, and keep going. It's easier to do, it's more taxing to take the alternative route. So, yeah. I imagine there's a, a whole other level of anxiety for people like you who are oh, constantly, yeah. you know, swimming in these waters, so to speak. Yes, we know that professional climate scientists and activists and green political leaders and climate journalists, those who have their, their focus on this eight plus hours a day, do bear a significant psychological toll from the intolerable knowledge that they hold. It's, it's painful. And there's a saying about how, you know, we really can't expect to bear witness to suffering and not have it rub off on us. It's as though we would imagine we could walk through water and not get wet. And that's what's going on with the vicarious trauma that bearing witness to struggles of 
communities already bearing the brunt of species that are going extinct, of opportunities not taken, and being, you know, gaslit or belittled or dismissed by powers that be over and over again when we have solutions, um, that that really does rub off on people and requires some specialized support. It's interesting, there's been some studies of this looking at um, how climate scientists cope with the emotional intensity versus climate activists, for example. And because there's no norms within the climate science community to really bring this up, especially, you know, we're trained as scientists to be objective and leave the irrational out. Um, and we, we might fear that we would be judged for sharing any emotions, but then it leads to emotional suppression, which is not a good coping skill. And eventually the feelings come up and when you can't batter them down anymore, then there's extra shame for feeling bad in the first place. And all of this um, can lead someone to, to more cost to well-being as opposed to activists who intentionally create space to contain, in psychology speak, the emotions, to allow them to be there, to validate them, legitimize them, and share them with others, which can create a transformative process of moving through them and allowing them to strengthen you and reinforce the work that you're doing which we'll talk about a little bit more um, in okay. a minute. Yeah, but I, I wanted to address your own personal journey. And of course, I love to point out that ideas has a, had a very small part in, in this whole story. A very important part, I will say. In this whole story beginning. You, you made a documentary for CBC Ideas. Yeah. It was a few years ago. And, and you sort of tested your desire, if I may describe it for you, but Please. for the audience, but where you basically tested your desire to have a child against the reality of, a climate, of the climate future that we know we have. I wonder what the biggest question was that you were trying to answer in that documentary. I was first and foremost trying to understand if this is a societal phenomenon, if this is perhaps overly privileged worrying that I was connecting family planning to the climate crisis and curious about what philosophers, ethicists, climate scientists, activists, parents, non-parents think about this today. At that time, in 2017, when I started doing that research, I really hadn't seen that many people validating this, and I didn't feel met by my friends when I would ask them about it. I felt quite isolated in asking the question at all, but I started poking around for the documentary, doing some research, and I discovered quite quickly that there was a frothing conversation just under the surface um, that many people were sharing. And in the years since, it's been wild to watch that rise very much above the surface. We Where have, was it before, if under the surface? Well, that there were people who, if you put a poll out on social media and sent it far and wide, you would get some responses, for example, but it wasn't yet being talked about in our media. We didn't have researchers with um, polls and surveys garnering powerful statistics about how prevalent it was. We didn't have celebrities coming out and speaking on it or politicians validating the question of if it's okay to have children, all of which have happened since then. In that study of 10,000 16 to 25 year olds, by the way, that my colleagues and I conducted, 39% of those young people said that the climate crisis makes them hesitant to have their own kids. In a different representative study of American youth, 78% of Gen Zers said that climate change makes them not wanna have kids. Wow. So it's really burst open, plus media are reporting on it all the time, and I'm, I'm just a little bit dizzy at how quickly that has changed. In writing the book, uh, you met people who had been, you know, going through that same questioning, trying to figure out what what the right answer was. Were there any that any examples that really stuck with you? Well, yes, from from many different angles. I met some people. For example, one mother who decided to have a child despite her climate anxiety, and the entire time through her pregnancy, she had nightmares and visions of having to run with her child. Um, having her child witness her parents dying, um, struggling in, in conflict and, and basically pure survival mode uh, as she's getting ready to welcome her kid into the world. 
I spoke with people who had decided certainly to not have kids um, because of the climate crisis on many occasions. Often the reasons that people would put forth for that were things like, I cannot fight the climate crisis as effectively if I have to use all that time and energy to put into raising you know, a, a child. Um, I can't put my body on the line if I believe in nonviolent direct action as, as a form of that, because if I go to prison, that would be an impediment. Um, people would talk about simply not being strong enough, not having the, the strength and resilience to both be there to parent and deal with this crisis, uh, which was a huge value for them. Others felt um, simply that, you know, if they were to have a child, despite their distress about what's going on, that they were doing it as some form of environmental politics. Like, if I have a child that I raise with my environmental values, and they will grow up to be the eco-warriors, so to speak, that can take on the future, which puts a lot of pressure on the kids, I gotta say. <laughs> um, Did that resonate with you at all? Not, not super deeply to be honest. Um, so although I think it's, it's, you know, I understand the sentiment very much, but I think we have far less control over our children than we might think we do. <laughs> um, another reason would be, yes, I'm having a child, actually in the, in the, in the book, I spoke with David Suzuki and um, his daughter, when she announced her pregnancy, uh, his, you know, he has, he told me about two daughters who announced pregnancies, but the first time that it that had happened, he said, oh my gosh, like, you know where we're headed, and this is going to be a really tough world to bring a child into, and what are you doing? And, and she said, you know, precisely. And the fact that I'm having a child put some stakes in the ground means that I'm going to do everything that I can with my full fiber and being to protect what I can for this child and for others. And he was blown away by that and said, well, that's incredible, and, you know, I had never thought of that before kudos to that reasoning. Um, and so these are the kinds of differences that would come up again and again in people's justifications. And of course, it's ultimately a very personal, subjective, no right, no wrong. Very personal. Very personal. Yeah. And, um, you know, some, some said, I can't, I can't live with myself doing this. I don't think it's ethical. Um, I don't see a future in which we're going to figure this out without a lot of violence. And I refuse to put a child into that situation. Mm -hmm. Um, it really did run the gamut. the gamut. You ultimately decided to go ahead and have a child with I a did. beautiful name, Atlas. I'm wondering, rather than the reason you did this more, or what eventually persuaded you to go ahead, I'm, I'm more curious about how the birth of your son might have changed the way you think mm -hmm. after the fact. It's interesting. I think I needed to have some plasticity to my thinking occur before I had him in order to go through with that, of course, thinking and feeling. A lot of my time on this project was spent integrating difficult feelings and emotions and trying to reconcile the rational parts that questions whether or not this is okay with the emotional impulses that wants to do this for all kinds of inexplicable reasons, dealing with love and connection and joy and also bringing in perspectives of many people who come to life in this moment from very different histories and ancestors than my own is hugely strengthening to talk with people who have lived through existential threat again and again and again and continue to put children into the world despite that which challenges them as a furtherance, as a continuance, as, a, as an emblem of resilience and we will be in the future and we will create the conditions to make it better for our children. And all of that really spoke to me in a deep way. Um, and now, you know, I really try to resist black and white thinking in the book all the way through. It, it's about managing the split of hope and fear, naive optimism versus like inaccurate doom and gloom and sitting in the gray zone. But ultimately, unfortunately, you can't have a gray zone baby. It's binary. You do it or you don't. <laughs> and um, so, so my reasoning did have to come down to something kind of binary. And when I was thinking about my role in all of this, 
I, I finally was able to let go of that big loaded question of, oh my gosh, is it okay to have a child and shift to something that looked more like, okay, what's required to have a child? What can I do to support a child? What kinds of communities of resilience can be um, specifically formed for, for him or her at the time, whoever it would be? Um, but it felt like going on the side of no child was a commitment for me to fear. It's not for others who choose this way. Um, while the opposite of going towards having the child was a commitment to joy because of the way that I was calculating from a fearful mindset often. Um, come what may, you know? And now that I'm dealing with the consequence of that decision, what it means is that I can never close my eyes to the crisis. I can never turn away out of self-comfort. I'm committing myself. I have changed my career. I have formed new colleagues. I am, you know, convicted mm -hmm. because and for him as, as much as other young people. So I think that's how it's changed me. That's quite profound. It's tough talking about this stuff all the time because it's so grandiose. You end up saying these <laughs> things that, um, but that's what this crisis does to people. Mm -hmm. I, I think it really does tap into that part of themselves that gets that existential meaning. Absolutely. You've uh, used also an equally impressive list of, uh, dis of descriptions of how, what feelings come forth when we talk about eco uh, distress or eco anxiety. I'm wondering where anger fits into this spectrum Ooh. of, of um, possible states of mind when you think about the climate crisis. Anger is a powerful and beautiful emotion that belongs squarely in the climate crisis that many people feel because of injustice. It's, it's anger and rage at the opportunities not taken to protect young people. It's anger about this feeling that the future is being cannibalized. It's anger at the corporate malfeasance um, and the predatory delay and it's hugely motivating. And that's the cool thing about anger. And there's been a study also looking at the impact of some of these climate emotions. And it's been found that as compared with the anxiety or the depression that comes with some people's distress about the climate crisis, the anger that can also be felt is a much better propellant into action into really reckoning with the transformative change one can make into bonding with others and and moving forward rather than getting stuck in one kind of dire place that mm -hmm. can preclude some of the action. Yeah. So, Generational resentment? Unfortunately, yes. And I don't think that that's a wise direction in which we should be moving. There is certainly generational resentment over this crisis. There's this idea that, you know, not to only single out the boomers, but, you know, the people in... Um, older generations, there's the okay boomer tagline that young people like to use, but um, you know that older generations had partied like there's no tomorrow and are not doing all that can be done now to clean up the mess before they're no longer with us. Um, but it, it really accounts for anyone older than particularly Gen Z and, and millennials. Um, that many young people do do speak of this kind of resentment for, but we need intergenerational solidarity more than ever, and we certainly will not get there by raising people's defenses and making them feel attacked. And there's so much that can be done to to step into that kind of care and connection now, no matter how you've been living and whether you're new to caring about climate, you know? So, um, yeah, rage is there, though. Rage, and, and also about caring about the environment. I, I do wonder, you raised this very close to the beginning when you talked about the corporate responsibility or government failure to act and, yeah. and kind of these, you know, responsible bodies, you know, acting in self-serving ways when it comes to climate. Why do you think that there are, let's say, certain corporate interests or rich people or powerful people who, who feel exempt from... Um, from from caring about the climate disaster, is there like wh why don't does it, it appears that they don't really want a safe and healthy future, even if it's selfish? Why do you think that is? The most compelling work I've seen that can map out why psychologically this might be the case is is the exceptionalism that our culture has bred over the last many decades 
particularly through neoliberalism and ideas of individualism and being able to rise above the common good. And that's sure, that, that's okay for everyone out there, but not me, I can do what I want. <laughs> um, and that we are fed these ideas through, of course, marketing, and discourse, and propaganda, and, and, and so on and so forth. The work of psychoanalyst Sally Weintraub is the most eloquent at spelling this out. And she really describes what we're dealing with now as a bubble. And that there have been many kinds of bubbles throughout history, financial bubble around the subprime mortgage crisis, and you know, other, other types of type, times by which powerful people foment bubbles in order to really conceal the truth in which if, if the truth were seen clearly, the citizenry would be full of rage, right? About what is being taken from them. But uh, these bubbles are seeded and inflated by the powerful through you know, propaganda marketing, kind of neoliberal ideology makes this easy. And then, um, and then when the bubble prop pops and fraud is revealed, it is not they who suffer. For example, you know, the foreclosures after 2008 crisis, um, uh, six million Americans uh, being devastated by this, but then bankers making money off of it, that kind of thing. And she says that what we're dealing with now in the climate bubble is far more consequential because it involves taking all for now and leaving life bereft of a future through these kinds of dynamics, which is only made possible by the logic of exceptionalism and that we don't all have, have some responsibility we need to tap into. And so her invitation is for us to really try and, and do what we can to reattach to the caring parts of ourselves. And you know, it's normal. We all have exceptional parts of ourselves that like to make excuses and do what we want. But we can't let it run away in the way that it has, especially in, since the 1980s. Is it fair to say, uh, upon reading your book, is it fair to say that you don't explicitly reach across the aisle? <clears throat> Excuse me and kind of, you know, tone down your politics or, let's say, leftist ideas yeah. in the interest of trying to draw, you know, the other side, or other sides, I should say, there are many sides. Uh, what, why, would you, why did you not do that, do you think? Yeah, I think it's fair. I think it's fair. I think it's um, partly my own anger <laughs> coming through and frustration of how late in the game it is and how much time we have wasted and how much predatory delay we have danced with. And not wanting to play the both sidesism of this anymore <laughs> and really wanting to get to the root of the matter, which is that for me, <laughs> because we understand that this is an anthropogenic crisis, it's caused by human behavior, right? We do not have the behavioralists at the table talking at our UN climate negotiations. Where are the psychologists? Where are people who are trained and understand strong forces like denial in this conversation? It's been sorely lacking and so really digging into the psychological underpinnings and impacts of the climate crisis brings us to a perspective in which I'm, we're not trying to negotiate across the aisle as much as deal with the human psyche and how it's fomenting this crisis and being impacted by it. And it is very emotional in its tone. So that was more my focus than trying to reconcile what really is a tragedy that it's become a partisan issue because this is an about human health. Um, you know, anyone can feel eco-anxiety if they recognize and understand that their own health is tied up with the health of the wider environment. And that's where I th thought that we needed to focus the conversation. Okay. You write that eco-distress needs to, write to, the, to rise to the surface and, and be met head on if there is going to be transformational work. Yes, because we need to feel uncomfortable about what's happening. But is it fair to say that us actually feeling this way, that you know, the distress or the anxiety, that itself it is a necessary step to actually get us somewhere? I.e., it's actually, it's good that we're going through this. I do believe that, I do. Uh, these feelings are certainly difficult to grapple with on one's own, but they are manageable 
when we come together and allow them to be there, validate them, give them permission, and then they start to move through us, and they can teach us things. They point things out about what we care to do, and importantly, can remove distractions and help us hone in on what's meaningful, right? It's a, it's, it's a form of suffering, yes, but we can certainly cultivate and shape meaning out of suffering. This is what humans have always done. And when we can tap into the purpose available from these emotions, rather than being comfortable, not cluing in, ignoring this, remaining in different forms of soft denial, um, we're gonna get there much faster by by being uncomfortable at this time as you know the disasters pile up and the potential to cross tipping points um, alongside that. So, so yeah, I think it's I think it's very healthy. I think it's very good. I think we need to support people so that it doesn't become debilitating. We especially need to support young young people so that it doesn't impair their functioning. But then we need to harness this for transformative change on climate. So, on the micro level, is that effectively what's happened with you? Very much so, yeah. You say that, as a result, your mission has changed entirely. In what way? Well, I was wrapping up a PhD in a different field, looking at the social and ethical implications of synthetic biology, which is, Useful. you know, about bioengineering. <laughs> and um, I was newly minted in that, but just I dropped it, and I became curious about how I could make meaning from this distress, how I was clarifying that um, what felt purposeful, me, purposeful for me to do was to then shift over to this new burgeoning area of, of climate and mental health, which I would never have done if I didn't feel eco-anxiety or grief or, or basically have compassion for the vulnerability of others to it because I know that it can be really overwhelming. And that has in turn helped me cope you know, um, being able to be part of this movement and, and help others is, is really healing in itself. So that's what's changed. But specifically looking at the, the alarming um, disproportionate impact that it's having on young people's health and mental health has been hugely concerning for me. Um, and it's, it's not what I'm trained in. So I had to do the grunt work to be able to shift over and then start participating. You also really took pains to kind of balance out the book between, you know, the, the negative, but also the hope and the, yeah. the, the possibility in, in this transformational work. Why was it important to do that to you? Because the hope is also authentic and available. And there's so much power that those of us who are alive in this moment have over how bad it's going to get which is radically hopeful. There's a lot we can do. We aren't helpless. We aren't powerlessness, powerless, and we aren't doomed, you know? Um, that is an important aspect of coming together with others to, can, again, contain the distress in such a way that we can make meaning from it and then do what hope actually is. I think we hugely misunderstand hope we think of hope as being this thing out there, an object that we must obtain and hold in order to then get to work. But what I learned from researching my book is that you really don't need to have hope in order to act. You can be totally hopeless and start acting. And it's when you roll up your sleeves and you come together with others and you make changes that you then create the conditions for robust hope, the way that hope actually works, right? You, you produce it. <laughs> But do you need hope to sell the message of action to people? Is that crucial? I've learned that it's not. I think that we can be hope free and still work and still act and still find strength with one another through this and through the discomfort. It is a hard sell in our landscape. Um, but I think it's an important lesson that we can we can all find in different ways that, yeah, sometimes it's even more motivating to be hope-free, and then it can allow you to actually create some hope. There's been some criticism, I guess, by people both of, of, of coverage of um, environmental issues, but also just the discussion around it, that it is too negative, that people tune out because it is negative. Yeah. I'm curious what you make of the role of journalists in all of this. I mean, you, 
you, you, I mean, you, that is a title that you had at one point, a journalist, I yeah, guess. Yeah, like, sure. So I'm just, when you look at the landscape today, how would you describe the way that media has handled environmental issues? Well, it's been a bitter pill, hasn't it? <laughs> you know, the headline after headline after headline that narratively forecloses closes our sense of what's possible in the future and, and makes it feel very authentic to connect with a sense that it's kind of over. <laughs> um, and we know that that distressing information is important when it's coming from scientifically verified sources. And we have to be open to the alarm. However, our brains over respond to negative information. And we need to balance it out with the simultaneous truths of, of hope, of, of nourishing stories, of small wins, of things that people are doing creatively in their communities to deal with this and build resilience and prepare and adapt. And all of that can really help us find a more accurate kind of um, well-rounded matrix of feelings in which we can sit with this because what we're being challenged to do is go beyond the black and the white and really sit in that tension of uncertainty around how bad it's gonna get, how nations are gonna respond. And when we can do that, it's, you know, we kind of have to engage in some mental gymnastics because our brains don't like uncertainty, but we can actually transform uncertainty into a resource rather than something to be afraid of, um, a potential that things can come into the fore that we want and that we can work for them. So it's journalists' responsibility as well to tell those stories. And if we're going to serve up a lot of bitter pills, to also do it alongside constructive actions and ways that people can step into some agency, that would be a lot healthier. Um, you know, we're in a time when there are kids on TikTok talking about how the climate crisis makes them want to quote unquote unalive themselves, right? Unalive. Unalive was a trending thing horrifically on TikTok um, because of the climate crisis. And uh, they are sitting on devices, taking in negative headline after negative headline about what is in their future rather imminently, you know? And that is leaving them understandably in a very dire place, but it's also a huge forsaking of of what is possible and what is true and what they deserve. Um, so yeah, as storytellers, we need to also bring in the things we're working for and not just what we're working against. You write in the book, quote, that the world is ending, it has always been ending. What do you mean by that? There are many human civilizations that have come and gone, risen and of course fallen. There are communities who we are still living in relationship right now who say that the climate crisis is not their first apocalypse. For example, many indigenous peoples. The first apocalypse happened with settler colonialism and when the white man came and stole their land and then wouldn't let them speak their language or use their traditions and stole their children. I mean, these are real apocalypses that have traumatic intergenerational effect. And we can speak about so many other communities. And yet, there is continuance, and yet there is life, and yet there is resilience and strength. And the thing about the climate crisis that makes a world is ending kind of notion for many people, um, it might be the first existential threat if we've been privileged and protected and, and not ever aware that the world is as tragic and fragile as it is on a personal level, and this new awakening kind of causes the internal shattering that can um, leave people lost in between stories, stories of the world that they were taking for granted and then now they need to shore themselves up and think of robustly supportive stories for the future. Um, that's, a, that's a kind of end of the world when your narratives are changing, you know, and that you need to, to, to get to the other side of, which, which is possible. Um, Timothy Morton, the philosopher who's sometimes called the prophet of the Anthropocene for his writing, um, he says that the world is ending in the climate crisis because it, it gets rid of our illusions that humans are in control and that we can dominate nature and do what we want with it without horrific consequence because it's coming back to bite us and show us that we're not in control and that we're actually majorly vulnerable, but that that's nothing new, that we always have been. And so that it's actually a really refreshing thing to think that the world is ending if that was our worldview and to open up to interconnection and partnership and being one with nature in a really deep sense. 
I was, as I was reading your book, wondering what you're thinking when you watch the rest of the news. There is so much happening oh, right yeah. now in the world, and not least the war in Europe and other places, other forgotten wars, and as you mentioned, the migration crisis, all so much yeah. stuff. Inflation, I mean, all these things. I just wonder how that affects the attention that we give to this this ecological disaster that's yeah. coming our way and, and, and the way we act to mitigate it. Yes. The dread is laid on thick right now because of all these threats. And we're, of course, just at the lightning tail of a pandemic and everything else you've mentioned. It's, it's certainly a lot and it's fascinating to see how people prioritize the crises that are stressing them most, right? You know, I was speaking with a friend earlier who doesn't feel eco-anxiety because the pandemic in Ukraine are taking everything that he's got, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and for me, because I've been so primed to the climate crisis, I actually found the pandemic a walk in the park. And so we have different um, ways in which we orient ourselves to the threat, and, we, and it's too much, we can't take it all in. And, um, you know, it, it certainly for the climate movement has been very distressing that over the last couple of years, while we've been facing so many other threats, that they have really garnered the global attention and the urgency, for example, around the virus that is required, that is appropriate, of course. But that also climate scientists have been telling us we need to also administer for this crisis in the same full force field, right? Treating it like a world war. Um, and so the fact that then it gets bumped to the lower place on the laundry list of priorities because of these other crises can, can make it more difficult to think about the urgency and the kind of narrowing time frame that we're always being told that we have to act within. Mm -hmm. Now your book, the, the one thing that your book really points out is that it, the conversation may be different among the younger uh, among us, especially in North America, let's say, or in the West, or people who generally use social media or who are having this conversation um, sort of in real time. Based on your research, just where do you think it sits, eco-anxiety and distress? Where does it sit among young people, the youngest among us, concerns about what's happening in this world right now? Well, enormously, enormously. We are facing a mental health epidemic within youth in many of the industrialized, like Western, Northwestern, especially countries. And suicidality, anxiety, depression, the statistics are skyrocketing compared to historical record. And it's interesting that it's consistently spoken of in terms of social media and the pandemic. And yet we have all this research now on climate change and mental health and the toll that it's taking on young people. And it's being treated as though it's some kind of hermetically sealed issue over there. They're obviously deeply interconnected. There are many societal pressures on young people that they're facing now and then this looming threat of environmental catastrophe um, that they sit with when con contemplating the future. So. I don't want to, you know, re-spell out that that study that we did, but there are there are others certainly like it that show us and that we can we can speak to young people, we can look at the youth activists who have been the most outspoken about the grief and despair and the hopelessness that they feel. We can speak to the teachers and the professors, the environmental studies instructors who claim that they have classrooms of despairing youth. They're just doing their jobs. They're just delivering their lectures on environmental sciences. But when young people come in, hopeful about learning, taking a degree, and then move partway through it, often quit because of the mental exhaustion and burnout, being too depressed, having it be too heavy on them. Um, these emotions have not yet been given a place. They haven't been acknowledged in climate and environmental education, and they need to be. Some people are innovative and trying to experiment now with this, that psychoeducation piece, building up emotional literacy, allows students to move through the feelings in community, know that they're not deviant for feeling this way, and actually find some strength. And again, this kind of robust hope by working together with others. So it's, 
we can see it. We can see it qualitatively in those kinds of scenarios, and and then we can we can see it in the polls, statistics, and and the youth climate movement. In the in the context of that, can you talk about the notion of good grief? Oh yeah, sure. So there is an interesting program called the Good Grief Network that has created a. Uh, a structured experience for people facing eco-distress that's modeled off of Alcoholics Anonymous. So it's a 10-step program where there are individual themes for each meeting. You meet once a week over the 10 weeks, and you deal with, with questions like, um, you know, confront and accept the severity of the predicament, like know that I am part of the solution and the problem, um, face mortality, uh, these kinds of of big themes and what they do is allow people to again know that these feelings are healthy and that they need support for, for taking them on and by the end of the program have been led through a series of exercises to actually reinvest that emotional energy that they've lost by being so stressed out into actions that matter at this time into purposeful ways of confronting the crisis with others and importantly not prescribing what that action looks like. Because we humans are super fickle creatures psychologically. We need to know that we are authoring our own story for something to stick, for us to step into a role, a new identity, you know, commit. And so um, it, it's, a, it's a non prescriptive way of helping people do that work and then find their new story and step into that role and take up the agency that's available. And, you know, grief is a very powerful emotion, as people will know. We only grieve for what we love. And that grief is about much more than just recognizing difficult emotions of loss, but as grief moves through us, it actually causes us to relearn the world and how we're gonna respond in the face of choiceless events when we lose things that are dear to us. Um, and so that can teach, heal, and change you. And it's, uh, it's, it's powerful in a, in a very productive way when it comes to ecological grief because we're not necessarily, you know, talking about the finality of death. There's a mobilizing potential there. I mean, of course, sure, if it's a species that you're grieving and they're going extinct, it might be more final. But um, yeah, in terms of what this means for climate on the whole or uh, any of the knock-on effects, there's a power to mourning. Activists have shown us this time and time again. Um, what happens in the AIDS epidemic. Many, many people were dying. It was being disavowed. Ronald Reagan wasn't talking about it. Thousands had already perished from the virus. And it took rabble rousing from activists saying, we're gonna bring these people, predominantly men's bodies, into the realm of mattering from not mattering by getting loud, by per performing, by hosting art events, by protesting, and this idea that, you know, we say a lot when we say nothing at all, right? And so um, similarly, of course, Black Lives Matter. It's a political platform based on mourning, like say their names and don't let anyone forget it. It points out this shared solidarity space for others to join us in that mourning and vocalization of what is unjust. And it's similar to ecological loss. In the book I write about Remembrance Day for Lost Species, which is a, a movement based on mourning extinct species that's popped up in chapters all over the world. And they host rituals around this to try and do a strange thing and create a time out of time to really contemplate the emotions that come with not only species extinction, but other environmental disruptions. So mm -hmm. grief can be really a wonderful kind of political tool to do something gesturish and, and, and even vibrant and lively around when we invite it into ritual with others. Thank you for that. One last thing from me before we go to questions from the audience. What can you leave us with, the public, the ordinary people? What kinds of actions could we take now to try to mitigate our own distress and anxiety? Well, the distress itself is this really powerful navigational tool, right? So if you're feeling bothered enough to want to do something that you perhaps haven't been doing before, I will um, ask you to visualize a Venn diagram here. So it comes from a marine biologist named Ayana Elizabeth Johnson, and I love it because it, it says, 
you know, once once you're feeling these emotions and you're coming into that that place of relating to your own role, you can ask yourself, what are my skills? Am I really good at numbers? Am I a spreadsheet person? Am I a communications person? Um, am I good with kids? I, whatever it might be that really allows you to already tap into your, your work in life. And then what brings you joy? What are the things that get you out of bed in the morning? What are you know your reasons for feeling vibrant and, and alive? And then if these are two Venn diagram circles up here, there's a third one down here that says, what is the work that needs doing, right? And really going deep on understanding the work that is available for us to partner with others on addressing in the climate crisis. And then where these three circles overlap, there's kind of a sweet space of agency that opens up for an individual subjective experience for us to walk into and find something that will work for us based on our passions, based on our skills, based on our awareness of what is troubling us. And that can be hugely healing to be able to, you know, find that meaning. And then when you start narrowing the gap between your actions and your values, that can bring some serious psychological relief. Britt Ray, thank you for taking my questions. So much insight, so many lessons. Thank you. Nala, thank you so much. Total pleasure.